Hey guys, it's Matt here. Welcome back to the Nintendo Corner. A name so generic I'm pretty sure I've stolen it without even realizing. Nowadays you can't even blink without a huge new media franchise popping up somewhere, and while many come and go before you can say poor business decisions, successful ones will remain within the realms of popularity long after we've all turned to dust. Star Wars, Marvel, Super Mario, Gex the Gecko, and of course the franchise we're going to talk about today. It's the one franchise that realized earning millions on video games is stupid when you can also earn billions on a metric f ton of stuffed animals, cardboard that makes grown men sh their pants of excitement, and movies so mediocre that M. Night Shyamalan is starting to get jealous. I'm talking of course about Pokemon, the franchise that started as a fun little digital version of its creator's favorite pastime as a child, bug catching. But nowadays it forms the highest grossing media franchise in history, while simultaneously confusing your grandparents, pissing off PETA, and kicking Mickey Mouse in the nuts. The aptly named Pokemon Company has become an overwhelmingly huge juggernaut that makes sure everyone around the world gets their annual dose of anime episodes, plushies and trading cards. And the only thing they have to do is torture the development team over at Game Freak into creating a new world, new region, new Pokemon, new characters, new lore and a new adventure within an incredibly small time frame. The end result? Gameplay that remained largely unchanged for the past three decades, graphics that look more at home on the PS2, and animations that make Stephen Hawking look like an aerobics class teacher. But please, my fellow Pokemon enthusiasts, don't skip this video because you think I'm going to talk shit about your favorite nope. franchise for 20 plus minutes. I've actually become quite obsessed with Pokemon myself as well in more recent years. Following nearly every Poketuber known to man, silently reading Bulbapedia pages until the early hours, and playing Pokemon Go like my life depends on it. I recently even caught this shiny Groudon, look at it, isn't it awesome? But even though I'm heavily invested in everything Pokemon related now, it didn't always used to be like that, and I had never actually played a main series title up until now. Which means there's more than enough reason to fire up the Nintendo Switch again and go on a journey through the 8th generation of Pokemon. Perhaps the most anticipated games in the franchise while simultaneously pissing off the most people at once, let's explore this semi-open world RPG, only taking occasional breaks to go on Twitter to rant about removing the national decks, ugly trees and absolute chonkers of Pikachus. Because in this review on Pokemon Sword and Shield, I'm going to find out if these games really deserved all the hate, or if they're actually secretly kind of really good maybe? Also spoiler alert I guess, but it's a Pokemon game, do you Really care. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Gala region, filled with new cities and routes to discover, and of course new Pokemon to catch. Though it wasn't as apparent in the first few Pokemon games, Pokemon regions are completely based around real world locations. For example, Gen 5's Unova is based on New York, Gen 7's Alola on Hawaii, and the Galar region here in Gen 8 is based on Great Britain. Except without wheels. And it's turned upside down. This is all portrayed in an arguably great art style and by making the whole region very stereotypically, almost laughably British. From the countrysides and architecture, to certain clothes people wear and the words they use, and of course how the Pokemon themselves are designed. Here you'll start your journey in a small town called Postwick, where you choose a character, get acquainted with some of the other characters like your mother and your rival slash neighbor slash best friend Hop, and of course you'll eventually choose a starter. The story largely revolves around two main plot lines. The first revolves around the region's championship, better known as the Gym Challenge. A series of challenges and battles in order to decide who will become the new regional champion, a title currently held by Hop's brother, Leon. The other plotline revolves more around the lore and mystery of the region, focusing on Galar's history and the legends that supposedly live within. Now if the premise of this game sounds familiar to anyone, that's because it's pretty much exactly the same as any other main series Pokemon game that came out in the last three decades. After 27 years of only being able to play main series Pokemon games on handheld consoles, Pokemon Sword and Shield would be the first step towards the Nintendo home console. 
The other big names within Nintendo had seen a release on the Nintendo Switch pretty quickly after launch, as well as being incredibly good games that showed how much this new console could offer these long-standing franchises. And sure, people were already able to play the Pokemon Yellow remake slash reboot that is Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, but that still didn't scratch the itch of a full-fledged main series Pokemon game on Nintendo's most recent home console. Of course, people got extremely hyped by this premise. No longer would we see the same low-quality 3D models moving around like 90s animatronics. This would be the step towards HD graphics, a huge open world with different biomes, Pokemon behaving like real animals while you're just silently lying there like some sort of 12-year-old anime rendition of David Attenborough, right before engaging in a Pokemon battle so epic it would put Bollywood movies to shame. But if the initial trailers weren't already an indication that this was never going to happen, then these first few hours with the game will most definitely shatter your RRR-inspired Pokemon dreams. While traveling from Postwick to the nearby town of Wedgehurst, the player encounters its first few moments of actual gameplay, battling Hop for the first time, being able to search through pretty much every house you can come across, and of course catching some of your first Pokemon. Now I'm not gonna sit here and pretend that battling them is difficult, because your starter will pretty quickly wipe the floor with every squirrel, caterpillar and bird you'll come across. But committing furry genocide isn't always the answer, since actually catching them requires you to keep them alive. And trying to find the right Pokemon for the right situation can be a lot of fun. Let alone that this teaches you the basics of a Pokemon game. Type advantages, Pokemon statistics, the stupidly overwhelming amount of items and movesets, etc. And honestly, for a game largely marketed towards children, the combat has an incredible amount of depth. But isn't it just a bit disappointing that the most positive thing in the early hours of the game is a bunch of mechanics that remained largely unchanged since the very first game? People already expected Pokemon to be more expressive and lifelike when the main series games made the transition into 3D back in 2013, let alone right now when it's on a home console. What we got instead are static 3D models that might as well still have been those pixelated sprites from 27 years ago. Moves like bites still don't actually show you a biting Pokemon. Most of the time moves are just visualized around a Pokemon, while the model itself barely moves an inch. It also doesn't help that every single Pokemon still makes a sound resembling the cries that were made for the Game Boy all the way back in 96. Later down the line, this will mean that your fully evolved Dragon type might look very menacing, yet its attacks looks like you're watching one of those early YouTube LEGO stop motion videos, while it sounds like a Tamagotchi. I can easily understand why it adds insult to injury when not long after the initial trailers released, the developers came out by saying, oh hey, by the way, we know how important it is to our fan base to be able to catch every single Pokemon known to man, but yeah, that's gone, so we could focus on improving the animations. Improving the animations. Improving the animations. Well, if these are improved animations, then Goat Story should be considered a masterpiece. Don't get me wrong, the simple fact that these 27-year-old battle mechanics still hold up is a testament to how good they are in the first place, but packaging them like this means that resources should have been spent more on improving animations and visuals, rather than playing fetch with your Pokémon. We continue our journey through Wedgehurst, where we'll eventually meet Sonia, assistant and granddaughter of the region's professor Magnolia. But first we make a quick stop in the mysterious forest known as the Slumbering Weald. Here the player and Hop first encounter two Pokémon shrouded in mystery. Not even being able to attack them, they disappear just as fast as they appeared in the first place. Which is more than enough reason to meet up with Sonia, Professor Magnolia and Leon. Unfortunately, not only does no one know anything about the mystery surrounding the forest that is literally next to your own f***ing house, but no one has ever heard about these two Pokemon you've just encountered. Which becomes more and more ridiculous as you'll progress through the main story. But honestly, enjoying a Pokemon game requires a Snorlax-sized amount of suspension of disbelief, so just go with it. 
At least this meeting wasn't for nothing, because both Hop and the player get endorsed by champion Leon to take part in the gym challenge, and you'll get this fancy bracelet, which I'll explain later on. For now, it's just a matter of obliterating tiny creatures, crushing low-level opponents, skipping through the dialogue, and not paying attention to all the items you'll find, because this game is already way too easy without using them, and before you know it, you'll reach the train station in Wedgehurst, where your Pokémon journey can truly start. The train in Wedgehurst brings us towards the next big city, but in order to get there we must first cross a huge piece of open land filled with wild Pokemon. Being one of the biggest selling points of Pokemon Sword and Shield, this huge piece of land known as the Wild Area is an area in which the player can encounter several Pokemon varying in size, species and level. But probably most importantly, it's the first time the series moved towards an actual open world giving the player full control over the camera and more freedom in catching different species of Pokemon in the early hours of the game. Factors like the weather and time of day decide which Pokemon spawn where, and as you'll progress through the story, more areas open up and higher level Pokemon become catchable. You can even connect with the internet and meet other people in this area. For a very short amount of time, this is exactly what the wild area appears to be. But just like pretty much every other aspect of the game, cracks slowly start revealing themselves. As I've said before, I really appreciate Pokemon Sword and Shield's art style. But the same cannot be said about the graphics and fidelity. From blurry textures to pixelated grass and from oily looking water to the infamously outdated trees, it looks ridiculously bad. In every other part of the game, the camera is fixed, making sure it's always pointed towards the best looking part of an area. But in the wild area, you can move your camera towards every single hideous corner this open field has to offer. I'll admit that it looks cool to see the big cities out in the distance and the bigger vantage points giving you some excellent views of the area, but that's all in the background, while the things right in front of you look incredibly lifeless. Pokemon, NPCs and the interactable berry trees don't spawn in until you stand right next to them, let alone that they don't interact with the world or other creatures around them. The higher level Pokemon can't be interacted with until a lot later in the game, the weather literally changes with every step you take and performance drops significantly in this area, especially when playing online. Just like in the rest of the game, items on the ground are represented by either a Pokeball or a little Twinkle, which might be a nitpicky thing to complain about, but I think it's a dumb design choice as well as that it magnifies the emptiness of the wild area even more. But luckily there are positive things to say. In the wild area you'll also find huge beams of light stemming from holes in the ground. These are called raid dens. Most likely based off of raids in Pokemon Go, Raid Dens let you encounter some powerful Pokemon which you can defeat by yourself or online with your friends. Basically every Pokemon can be encountered here, from low level first stage Pokemon to fully evolved ones. It's genuinely a lot of fun to engage in raids and this gives the game a lot of replayability. So even though the wild area overall is kind of a disappointment, there are some fun things to do and it's a great place to start putting together your team. And let me tell you that creating a team is just as much fun as it has always been, mostly because Pokemon designs are arguably better than they've ever been. I'm willing to admit that my own playthroughs look more like a beauty pageant than a fighting game because I'm much more interested in which Pokemon looks the best or has the most interesting design. And sure, I can understand the Gen 1ers clinging on to the nostalgia of the first generation, or people preferring Gen 3 because it has Metagross, and you're not wrong by the way, but developer Game Freak has really nailed Pokemon designs in more recent years. Here's a few examples. The starter Pokemon each represent a feature that is very distinctively British. Cinderace is a reference to popular sports in Great Britain, most notably football, or soccer if you want to get technical about it. Inteleon is a nod to the most British spy in pop culture history, James Bond. Rillaboom is one of the many references to the fact that a lot of famous bands and musicians come from the UK. Poltergeist is a little ghost that inhabited a teapot, referencing Great Britain's undeniable connection to tea. But some are a bit more obscure than that. Impidimp and its evolutionary line reference European folklore and fairy tales in which the world is inhabited by imps, goblins and gremlins. 
The early years of British archaeological finds are plagued with mismatched fossils thought to be connected to each other. And so the fossil Pokemon in Galar are mismatched as well. And speaking of archaeology, a lot of real life science and history makes its way into these designs. Starting in Generation 7, Pokemon went full Charles Darwin with the introduction of regional variants. Just like in real life, the appearance or characteristics of a creature can change depending on the environment it lives in. For example, a bird that lives off of hard-shelled nuts. <laughs> a bird that lives off of hard-shelled nuts needs a stronger beak than one that lives off of berries. So over the course of several millennia, a species can evolve in order to adapt to certain conditions. In a similar way, we see Pokemon change depending on their environment. The coughing in the Galar region had to get used to the toxic fumes created by factories during the Industrial Revolution, making Galarian wheezing look like this. Darumaka decided to live in the snowy mountains alongside Sir Chester up north and so changed into an ice type. Zigzagoon mostly lives in rural areas, but a life on the streets and the emergence of punk culture forced it to adapt as well. Its rugged lifestyle even gave it a new, more resilient evolution. In short, every single Pokemon design has these sorts of interesting features. But even if you don't like any of the newly introduced Pokemon, a lot of the older Pokemon also appear in the Galar region. And I get it, with the removal of the national decks, not all of the thousands of Pokemon are available in this game. But first of all, no one cares that Jinx isn't here. And second of all, believe me when I say that catching 400 of those bastards is already hard enough. North of the wild area, we reach the industry-focused Motostoke city. Based on real industrial cities like Manchester and Liverpool, Motostoke is filled with factories and mechanical looking contraptions. It's no surprise that it's home to the fire type gym and it's where the opening ceremony of the gym challenge takes place. Pokemon Sword and Shield yet again largely stays the same as any other Pokemon game in this regard. You fight a gym leader, gain a gym badge and move on to the next one. Before fighting the gym leader, the player must make their way through an obstacle course, solve a puzzle or complete a certain task. These differ per gym and are actually pretty fun to do as well as being kind of challenging sometimes. When completed, the player can finally face off against the gym leader in this massive sports arena looking stadium. By far one of the biggest improvements that Sword and Shield bring to the table is the presentation of its gyms. Not only do some of these gyms resemble real life sports stadiums like Anfield and Wembley, but it's accurately selling this sense of skill and excitement that comes with a sports tournament. It is of course kind of a huge shame that battles still play out in the same way as always, and in these battles and cutscenes it also becomes blatantly obvious that this game desperately needed voice acting. But yelling fans, the overall presentation and excitement make up for a lot of that. And in addition to amping up the stadiums, they quite literally amped up the Pokemon as well. In the Galar region, Pokemon gyms are built on top of what are known as power spots. A mystical force which in combination with that bracelet we talked about gives Pokemon the ability to Dynamax. Which means that for 3 turns a Pokemon can grow to an enormous size, dealing extra damage while being able to deflect more damage themselves. And I can hear you think, ah Matt it's not that interesting, they're just bigger Pokemon. But honestly it's so well implemented. Watching Pokemon beef it out on a Godzilla sized scale in a gym that is much more resembling the gyms we see in the anime is just pretty fucking awesome. But on top of that, when used at the right time, it can actually be an interesting way to turn the tide of a match. And where most of the sound in the game is pretty disappointing, the sound design during Dynamax fights is absolutely brilliant. Pokemon cries echoing through the stadium. Attacks sounding like literal bombardments. And when a Dynamax Pokemon goes down, you'll definitely hear it.
I'd also like to take this small moment to say that the music in the game is also very good. But being surprised by the fact that music in a Pokemon game is good is like being surprised that water is wet. While I do agree that Dynamaxing isn't as cool as something like Mega Evolution, at least every single Pokemon is able to do it. And the game still has another trick up its sleeve, but more on that later. For now the ceremony is over and we go to our hotel where Sonia tells us more about the history of the Galar region. Legend says that centuries ago a catastrophic event known as the Darkest Day was stopped by someone simply known as the Hero and his trusted sword and shield. What this all means is not clear yet but for now that doesn't matter since we get challenged by a weird bunch of goons who call themselves Team Yell. They might seem very angry at first, but they eventually just turn out to be overly enthusiastic supporters for another gym challenger called Marnie. We manage to defeat everyone here and the very next day we continue our journey. Past the Galar power plant we make a quick stop to check out someone's campsite. It's one of the new mechanics in the game where you can socialize with your Pokemon while you can also make them curry. It has been presented as one of the big new things in this game, but honestly I really don't care about it so I'll make this quick. You can throw a ball, pet your Pokemon, and you can repeat the same minigame a hundred times in order to complete what is called the Curry Dex. Conclusion, it's boring, but I understand why it's here. Let's continue. After going through the first Galar mine, the journey towards the championship is pretty straightforward. We make our way across Route 4 and we reach the town of Durfield. Not only is this town covered with these huge inscribed stones, it's also home to a depiction of a gigantic Pokemon carved into the side of a hill. Of course this has something to do with the Dynamax phenomenon, but for now we just continue our way towards Turfield's grass type gym, where we participate in the gym challenge and eventually defeat the gym leader Milo. With our first gym badge in hand, we also acquire our very own Rodon bike and have one of the many fights against Hop, who despite his big words, still doesn't stand a chance. Not much later, we reach Holbury, a coastal town full of boats, a marketplace and a famous seafood restaurant. Here we have a meeting with one of the most influential people of the Galar region, Chairman Rose, together with his assistant Oleana. Of course, we participate in the gym challenge, defeat water type leader Nessa, and by crossing the second Galar mine and the Motostoke outskirts, we circle back towards Motostoke itself, where we try to defeat Fire-type gym leader Kabu. And while the bigger part of this gym challenge goes down in a similar way as any other, Kabu's final Pokémon, Santa Scorch, has something peculiar about it. Not only does it grow to a huge size, but it actually changes form. Yes, every Pokémon in the game can Dynamax, but only a specific amount of Pokémon can Gigantamax, which means that it grows to an insane size, but also changes in appearance similar to Mega Evolution and is now able to use special moves called G-Max moves. The upside to Gigantamaxing is that it makes the already very awesome Dynamax phenomenon even cooler and gives your Pokémon an incredibly powerful move, but unfortunately actually acquiring a Pokémon that is able to Gigantamax is incredibly convoluted. Sure, you can get several G-Max Pokémon as a reward for owning another game, using Pokémon Home, or simply by keeping an eye on mystery gift codes on the internet, but where's the fun in that? Actually catching one yourself is done in the earlier mentioned Raid Dance. Without going into too much detail, it takes a long time to be able to find a specific Raid Den with the right conditions to catch a Gigantamax Pokémon. Then when you find one, you first have to beat it with either your friends, random people online, or completely useless NPCs before having a chance to actually catch them. Even though using the NPCs is probably the most difficult way of defeating these battles, connectivity issues make it nearly impossible to play in any other way. So if you have a lot of patience, willpower and luck, then defeating a G-Max Pokémon is incredibly rewarding. But I'll leave it up to you to decide if it's all worth the trouble. Especially considering a Pokémon like Santa Scorch turns into a huge string of flaming condoms, so no, not all of them look very cool.
Needless to say, we defeat it and its leader Kabu in no time and so our journey continues through another part of the wild area in order to reach the second big city of the game. Hammerlock is based more around the royal and folklore aspects of Great Britain. Big buildings resembling castles, a huge part of the story revolving around the legend of the Galar region and it's kind of on the nose but this city is home to the dragon type gym. Before challenging that gym however, the player meets up with Sonia to discuss four historical tapestries depicting the history of the region. It's here we find out that the hero of the Gala region wasn't actually one man, but two brothers of which one wielded the sword and the other the shield. Now is it weird that this legend is told in a completely different way just a few miles south of here? Yes it is, but as I've said, suspension of disbelief. From Hammerlock we move west towards a desert town called Stow on Side. Here you'll find the fighting type or ghost type gym depending on what version you're playing. When defeated the fairy type gym in the beautiful town of Bellenly is up next after making your way through the even more beautiful fairy forest of Glimwood Tangle. Bede, one of the other gym challengers, catches up with you and decides to use the chairman's caparaja to destroy a piece of cultural heritage, but accidentally finds out that this mural was fake and the real prophecy was hidden behind it, showing that the two heroes of the Galar region were accompanied by two Pokemon. Apparently no one ever thought of performing some archaeological research on this site, but I will keep saying suspension of disbelief as long as you'll need to hear it. From here you'll skip towards the open fields of Route 7, the ancient ruins of Route 8 and eventually the snow-covered city of Sir Chester. You defeat the ice or rock type gym leader in this city depending on your version and you acquire another piece of the story. Though you won't find it in the bathhouse that was used by the heroes to heal after battle or in the historic city center or even near the gym, no, this mysterious missing fifth tapestry, a historical artifact depicting the actual history of the region, is hiding on the wall of a local curry restaurant. Anyway, in order to cross the icy roads and waters of Route 9, your road and bike needs a little upgrade, and so we reach gym number 7. The dark type gym led by anti-GMAX spokesperson and older brother of Marnie, Pierce. Contrary to popular belief, not everything in this game is based on Great Britain, because if the internet is to be believed, the rundown streets of Spikemouth are undoubtedly based on Ohio. Also, you've heard it correctly, this gym is a no GMAX zone. That still doesn't really matter though, because you'll make short work of it before already moving back to Hammerlock where you're now able to challenge the 8th and final gym. The dragon type gym led by gym leader Ryan. Quite frankly the most challenging gym of all, but still easily doable. And just like that, the 8 gym badges are yours and you're now able to participate in the championship. Despite the repetitive gameplay loop you'll encounter during these past few hours, I did really enjoy the overall presentation. Graphics aside, some of these areas look very appealing stylistically. There's a lot of variety in environments, a lot of secret passages you can explore, stores you can visit, and using your newly acquired ability to cross water even gives you some incentive to start backtracking. These are the moments where I actually think the game is a lot of fun to run around in. Feeling like your team is getting better, like the towns are more than just pretty backgrounds for a gym battle, like you're actually exploring a living, breathing world, even with the possibility to complete a few small side quests here and there. You'll once again step on a train, then cross the snow-covered roads of Route 10, and finally you'll reach the third and final big city of the game. Inspired by Great Britain's capital London, the city of Wyndon is home to the Galar Region Championship, as well as many hotels, shops, parks, and the chairman's headquarters, Rose Tower. Wyndon initially looks to be the biggest city of all, and that sense of scale is sold by showing you huge buildings and a varied backdrop. In reality, this city, similar to the wild area, has a lot of empty space. Many buildings you can't enter, lots of invisible walls, and a lack of animations for means of transportation like the monorail and the flying taxis. Instead, the screen just turns to black, which, by the way, is something that happens way too often in this game. Important moments in the story? The screen fades to black. Big explosion? It happens off screen. Pokemon interact with the world? Well, I hear it, but I don't see it. But 
But the reason why we're here is of course the championship. On the first day the player defeats both Marnie and Hop. You were supposed to meet with Leon afterwards, but he never actually shows up because apparently he went to Rose Tower. Of course we follow him even though we weren't allowed to, so these two underage kids fight their way through a heavily guarded building where they eventually find Leon and Chairman Rose in a heated argument. You see, Chairman Rose is scared that Gellar's future is at risk because the energy supply will eventually run out. So they should look for a solution. But Leon is like, we'll First off, you, oh my god, can you let me do what I need to do? Because he just wants the championship to continue. And so it does. The next day, the player fights its way through a bunch of gym leaders and bead. And just when it's time for the final fight against champion Leon, Chairman Rose interrupts the championship. Convinced that the Galar region should be safe from a future where all energy is drained, he now triggers the darkest day himself, which should suffice the Galar region's energy requirements for centuries to come. Obviously it's a stupid idea and the chairman doesn't understand that this sort of energy isn't containable. Therefore shit hits the fan all over Galar. Back in the slumbering wield, Hop and the player try to find the mysterious Pokemon again, but only find a rusted sword and shield. Take what you can get I guess, because when returning to Hammerlock they have to beat Chairman Rose and right after the legendary Pokemon Eternatus. Defeating it actually turns out to be very easy, but this isn't even his final form and so it Eternamaxes. All hope seems to be lost, but right at that moment Hop and the player raise the rusted sword and shield calling out to the mysterious Pokemon from before. And now their prayers are finally being heard. The legendary Pokemon Zashin and Zamazenta appear and help to defeat Eternatus once and for all. Which is great because it can now be enslaved and forced to kill squirrels for the rest of its existence. Session and Zamazenta leave in the most beautifully animated way I've ever seen and now the player can finally go up against champion Leon. An epic fight ensues in which Leon eventually calls upon his incredibly powerful Gigantamax Charizard, but we still manage to beat him. Ladies and gentlemen, the new champion of the Galar region is you. The end. Sort of. Of course there's still a complete post game to play, but first let's just get into everything we've learned about Pokemon Sword and Shield so far. From beginning to end, Pokemon Sword and Shield will feel very familiar to franchise veterans. Many staples of the franchise return, which isn't necessarily a bad thing at first. 27 years of fine tuning the same creatures, battle mechanics, items and moves make for a very polished experience as far as gameplay goes. It is fun to play because of this and in combination with its colorful art direction, incentive to explore and the undeniable charm and addictiveness of catching Pokemon, these are not hey. bad games at all. Some of the locations even make you feel like you're actually playing a new and upgraded Pokemon game. And while most of the animations still look horrible, the ones that have had a special treatment look incredibly good. Unfortunately, these are only reserved for legendary Pokemon and starters. The best way to describe this whole game is that it feels incredibly rushed. Here you have a main series Pokemon game on a home console for the first time, but every time it gives you a little hint of what's possible with this hardware, that's actually all you're going to get. Just a few improved animations, a few new mechanics that no one actually asked for to be honest, and of course a new region with new lore, but not nearly the amount of that that people were hoping for. Don't get me wrong, not every single game has to be a Red Dead Redemption 2, and I personally don't have a problem with the Pokemon company wanting to have an annual release for their main series games. But Assassin's Creed does annual releases as well, and those games look like this, while Pokemon Sword and Shield look like this. In other open world or semi open world RPGs you actually get a deep combat system, character progression, an incredibly well thought out world with its own history and cultures, people interacting with the world around them, biomes filled with creatures that fit their environment and behave as actual animals, and you can go on like that. 
After literal decades of Pokemon games, there is this huge pile of lore, history, fan theories, urban legends and whatever that the developers have been sitting on. Entire YouTube channels exist solely to uncover these things. It's basically all already there and even Pokemon itself seems to be interested in making a game which does actually feature all of the above. Something like Legends Arceus immediately comes to mind as a step in the right direction. But in Sword and Shield we don't get biomes filled with Pokemon that behave like actual animals and interact with each other, like we see in New Pokemon Snap for instance. We get to read about Pokemon's behavior in the Pokedex while the actual Pokemon just stand still or walk around in an empty field with exaggerated weather conditions. We don't get a story in which the history, legends and myths of the regions are thoroughly investigated and eventually end in an epic conclusion. We get a story as shallow as a puddle of piss in a public restroom, where portions of the story are only presented in cutscenes and nothing seems to be cohesive. To add insult to injury, this generation's mythical Pokemon Zarude doesn't get some sort of epic side quest. No, it's only obtainable through a reward code. We don't get a cool rework of the combat system which retains the turn-based mechanics we know and love but makes it more of a visual spectacle. Maybe even getting something like we see in the Final Fantasy VII Remake. No, we get the same gameplay as always, packaged in underwhelming graphics and laughable animations. We don't get big cities filled with NPCs and activities. We get lifeless cities with copied shops and buildings and a bare minimum of NPCs and actual things to do. You're basically just playing a slightly upscaled version of a game which might as well have been released on a handheld. Or even worse, on mobile. And I know that some people will have you believe that Pokemon Sword and Shield just tries to stay true to Pokemon's core. Which could be true, but in reality the game feels like there just wasn't enough development time to try something new and interesting, or at least fully polish everything that is actually in the game. I'll say it again, this is the highest grossing media franchise in history, there should be more than enough money to expand the development team and still release games annually. After writing this script I actually started laughing at myself a little bit. I've been pretty hard on Pokemon Sword and Shield and with good reason, since the game is lacking around pretty much every corner. Yet despite all of that, I still played through the entire game three times, finished the post game three times, which by the way is pretty crappy for people who have Pokemon Shield because Samazenta is basically useless while Zacian might be one of the most overpowered Pokemon ever made. I became addicted to Raid Dance and the Battle Tower, collected all the G-Max Pokemon that are available in the game, bought both of the games second hand in order to complete the entire Pokedex, grabbed the shiny charm so I of course indulged in some shiny hunting, tried breeding for the perfect IV Pokemon, watched people play Nuzlocks on YouTube and followed every single theory or lore video by Birdkeeper Toby and Loxton and Noggin. But why? Well, the answer is actually pretty easy. Pokemon Sword and Shield are not the best games in the franchise. In fact, probably some of the worst. They're held back by a rush development, outdated gameplay and an overall lack of polish. Right at a time where new additions were desperately needed, easily possible and widely hoped for. But even with all these negative aspects, it's still an incredibly enjoyable game, simply because it's another Pokemon game. And Pokemon games are a lot of fun. Catching Pokemon, exploring the region, becoming the champion, it's all very addicting as well as that the community build around the franchise keeps coming up with more and more ways to enjoy these games in several different, sometimes unintended ways. But with that said, I'll never recommend anyone to buy Sword and Shield. Nintendo being Nintendo, the game is still being sold for full price, even in 2023. And such a flawed game is just not worth that price tag. Luckily, there are many games in the franchise that are a lot better, a lot more polished, and aren't sold for the full price. So if you ever want to play Pokemon Sword and Shield, slap yourself in the face and play Platinum instead. Thanks for watching. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments why you liked or disliked Pokemon Sword and Shield. And of course, let me know what you thought of the video. I really want to say thank you to all the people that are watching my videos. And even though I'm not able to upload that much, the support so far has been really great. So thank you, and I'd like to see you in the next video. Bye!